Most trading card games last only two years. Time and time again, we see them make the same mistakes and crumble for the same reason. Falling victim to the seven deadly sins of trading card games. Like a video game that's been based on a movie, a trading card game based on a movie tends to suck. They tend to suck largely because they are put together on a rush development cycle, strangled by tons of bureaucratic red tape, using incomplete information, not a lot of resources, and a ton of gimmicky mechanics made due to crunch. The end. <sighs> Uh, okay, let's talk about licensing. So, just to put this dog to bed once and for all, there have been trading card games based on movies, most of which appeared during the big Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh! era surge of them back at the turn of the millennium, and most of them are just as shovelware as the video games made for the same impulse cash and incentive. But here's the thing, by their very natures, movies and trading card games are incompatible. A TCG, CCG, LCG, whatever, is supposed to be a lifestyle commitment, something that is maintained for a long time with regular updates and content. Movies, however, are a flash in the pan. They come out, people watch them, and then life goes on. Even if a movie keeps getting talked about for years afterwards, it's quite unlikely that the people talking about it would be enough to maintain a card game. They just don't provide enough content. Good luck squeezing a 300 card set out of a 90 minute movie. If you really, really want to make a card game based on a movie, you're better off making a self-contained, one and done game that matches the flash in the pan lifespan of the films themselves. The problem here is pretty self-explanatory, that's why it's a sin, but I figured rather than just leaving it there, we might as well take the opportunity to talk about licensing. Licensing, when talking about entertainment products, is the process through which a brand sells the rights to use their intellectual property to another company, allowing them to use assets, designs, characters, and other copyrighted materials for things like merchandise, clothing, toys, and other things, usually for a fee, a proceed of the profits, or both. There are certainly benefits to licensing. As I've detailed in some of my other videos, a recognizable brand is a great way to catch attention and get your foot in the door. The licensor will frequently share their pool of stock assets Sets to give your product an instantaneous set of design resources, and proper leveraging of fan feedback can allow you to create something that resonates with a community that already exists. If you make your own original creative concept without any licensing, while you would have full control over your own game, you'd still be fighting to be noticed against the huge flood of other games doing the exact same thing, which can be hard if you lack real punch and drive with your concept and your promotion. If you're somebody whose creativity manifests at a technical level rather than an artistic one, who makes systems rather than worlds, plugging a license into your creation can fill the gap in that part of your design. But keep in mind that it is a trade-off. Licensing a brand's intellectual property doesn't tend to give you free reign to do with it as you please. These license holders have an image to uphold, and any ideas you come up with have to be run by them before you can move ahead to make sure it adheres to that image. No Star Wars licensor is going to let you move forward with a card depicting Luke Skywalker blasting a hole through somebody, even though that actually happened at some point. Licensors want control over how their brand appears in the broader market, and some can be more onerous than others, especially the bigger the brand gets. And of course, that sword of Damocles always hanging over your head, the licensing fees. If your game is only kinda successful, you're at serious risk of the licensing costs devouring your profits and your margin for error is remarkably slim. Which, by the way, is a problem that a lot of the most popular games based on brands don't tend to have because they're made by the same companies that own the property rights. Kind of unfair when you think about it. Still, it's far from impossible. A lot of popular and memorable games got good runs despite being made third party. Who knows, you might totally hit it off with a licensor who shares your vision of what the brand is about and come up with some really cool stuff. And some people have. A lot of them even made it despite using stock assets. Ah, good time to talk about this. A few of my viewers have questioned why using screenshots for card art wasn't put onto the sin list. Well, that's because it isn't. I mean, sure, if the screenshots are low quality garbage, that will always hurt a game. But bad visual design tends to harm a game no matter where it comes from. 
In fact, plenty of games have used stock assets, even screenshots, just fine with great success. Hey, hey, it's the latest collection of now, and that's what I call stock assets. All of your favorite games that use artwork that wasn't specifically created for them. Screenshots, character models, and all the stuff you love, now in one fantastic little package. I mean, sure. It's always great to see custom artwork for a card game based on a series you love, but don't quash the benefits of using stuff that already exists. Stock assets provided by the license holder are one less thing you have to run through their bureaucracy, and they already look good without having to shell out cash to an artist. Still, it's very easy to do it wrong. Meta X, a now-dead game that... Sheesh, this game has a ton of stock assets in clashing art styles that look less like they carefully picked through a library of assets and more like they skimmed through a Google image search. You've got cards with art like this mixed with cards that look like this. The images are poorly sized to fit into the card, they all use the same weird swooshy background that creates an uncanny effect. It's just a mess. Compared to a more fondly remembered comic book card game, Versus System, where each asset, no matter the art style, is bound within a box and frame, allowing the art style to exist in its own little universe. Versus System is kind of a neat game. It was like the only real Marvel vs. DC series, and it actually had crossover as a game mechanic. I've even seen a neat little trick in the lesser known Marvel Ultimate Battles game where the important hero cards are modeled after comic book covers. Now that would be neat. Imagine a DC or Marvel game where the cards were designed to look like comic book covers, with cards based on vintage issues having what looks like tattered and damaged edges around the border. Granted, Meta X ran into the unique problem of using superhero assets, which often have a variety of styles between various mediums, versus things like anime or video games, which tend to be a lot more strict about being on model, but the layout they wound up using was still not flattering to the assets they were given. Meta X in general is tied to a rise in what I call super license games, where a game licenses a ton of properties, usually for the duration of one set, to snap at something popular without it dominating their entire design. Sometimes they take hold, like UFS or Weisschwartz, other times they do not. Whatever you're doing, however, the licenses you pick need to fit. UFS and Exceed, for example, are one versus one fighting games, so they tend to license brands known for one-on-one -on -one fights, like Street Fighter or Shovel Knight. This would probably not be a good game to license Murder, She Wrote for. But back to what we were discussing before, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed a trend in all of the licensed brands that have had these sorts of successful card games. They are all part of an ongoing series. Now, an ongoing series that produces more content to be consumed is also producing more content to be turned into game components while also running alongside your game as a way to keep fans invested. These are the bread and butter of licensed trading card games, franchises with a reliable source of continuous content. TV shows, online games, or linear long-running stories have been the catalyst for many a successful game. Ongoing series? Wait, aren't there like movies that are part of an ongoing series? Wait a minute, why didn't I see it before? Clearly, we need to be making a trading card game based on... Yeah, there we go. Sure, it started as a movie, but Star Wars is the perfect candidate to get a trading card game. It's got a ton of lore, awesome characters, epic technology, a massive expanded universe, and it can't maintain a card game to save its life. Yeah, no joke, there have been many, many attempts to try to get a Star Wars trading card game off the ground. At least six attempts, to be precise. Yes, I know I'm holding on to eight cards here, just... Give me a minute. First, we got the Magic the Gathering piggyback game, Star Wars the CCG, which came out in 95, followed by Young Jedi in 1999 to tie into Phantom Menace, Star Wars the TCG, which released in 2004, Star Wars Pocket Model TCG in 2007, Star Clone Wars Adventure Wars in 2011, and finally, Star Wars Destiny in 2016. And that doesn't even count all the miniatures games that include cards as part of their gameplay. Star Wars has chewed up and spit out, on average, a different game every four to five years. Some die pretty quickly, some last a few years, some even overlap with other games, like the original CCG, which actually managed to crawl its way into 2001 before finally closing. But why does it seem so hard to keep a Star Wars game steady? Well, now that I think about it, 
it's actually kind of hard to pin down what Star Wars really is. Is it a series for adults or for children? Is it made for longtime fans or newcomers? Is the best part the lore, the action, the tech, or the characters? Is it a story about the duality between good and evil or a simple conflict of right and wrong? Is the Y-Wing the greatest vehicle in the series? Yes. The answer to that last one is yes. I mean, I get it. The duality between good and evil is a huge part of Star Wars, but that doesn't tend to manifest as a great game mechanic. It's just that basically all of these games use it. This one does it, and this one does it, and this one does it, and this one is just rock, paper, scissors, insta win garbage. Part of the fun of licensed TCGs is exploring unlikely scenarios. I mean, who's to say that Luke Skywalker and IG-88 would never team up? My one true pairing. And it doesn't help that the people in charge of the brand seem to have no idea how to handle it. Don't ascribe any subtext to that, I mean those words exactly. I mean, the people in charge of the brand didn't think it would be a good idea to have some Baby Yoda merchandise lying around in time for the launch of The Mandalorian. That's what I mean. So, let's take a look at the most recent one, Star Wars Destiny by Fantasy Flight Games. This is a game where the sequence of your turn is dictated by the roll of your character dice, with more cards adding additional dice to your dice pool. It uses a straightforward color mechanic similar to the one used in Bakugan, where you can only add cards of a certain color to your deck if you have a character of the matching color. The colors are simple red, blue, and yellow for military, Jedi, and scoundrel cards respectively. It was well received and looked to be the Star Wars game that could finally break the curse by properly divvying the sorts of things people like, whether it be the lore of the Jedi universe, the awesome tech of the various factions, or the defiant spirit of the space outlaws. However, despite its good reception, the game got canned earlier this year, even before the situation took hold. So what happened? Well, there was a big flaw in the rules where, again, you have to either build a good aligned or evil aligned deck, no mixing. Hello again. After a three year run, they introduced set rotation out of the blue and were actually getting ready to do another round of it less than two weeks before cancellation. That's another one. And on top of that, the game was plagued by irregular release dates and distribution. Uh, yeah, not really sure what to say about that one. And all of these problems were no doubt made worse by whatever crazy licensing fee Disney was charging at the time. I mean, the game was doing real well, being a top 10 seller even, but because it wasn't doing absolutely amazing, it was dropped. See what I mean by smaller margins for error? I mean, it doesn't help that Fantasy Flight makes their card games a little board gamey for my taste, but eh, different video. Odds are good we're not going to get a stable Star Wars card game unless Disney themselves bankroll one the way Pokemon and Bandai do theirs, but that's about as likely as another Marvel slash DC crossover at this point. So yeah, licensing a brand for your game can be a blessing or a curse, and the costs of that can be the difference between victory and defeat. I must emphasize, however, unless you have been hired by the license holder or you own the IP yourself, you should probably not design your game with a specific franchise in mind. I mean, there's nothing wrong with using them for inspiration, but by the time you have your game ready, everything that might have belonged to another franchise should be swapped out for something that belongs directly to you, so that you can have a full product that you can sell first, and then maybe approach the license holder to ask if it might be a good fit. But in the end, it's usually better to count on yourself. Keep that in mind, and you too can avoid falling victim to one of the seven deadly sins of trading card games. I'm afraid of